Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so grateful that even though our love is indeed often cold, and we would otherwise lose hope, you do hold us fast. You hold us tightly, safely, secure. We lean on arms that are everlasting. So Lord, this morning, we seek to continue praising you by hearing your word preached. The worship has not just ended. The worship continues now as we worship over your word. So Lord, give us sincere hearts to do just that, to glorify you and to ascribe to you what is due your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you would turn to Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, my name is Rex Blackburn, I'm not a pastor here, I'm a pastoral assistant here. Our normal teaching pastor, Alex, uh, is in a series on Matthew right now, and when I have opportunity to speak, we're in a concurrent series on the book of Philippians. So this is the third sermon in Philippians, from Philippians chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 18. While you're turning there, introductions can be a very helpful part of a sermon. They introduce. They start off the sermon. I usually have trouble finding the right type of introduction. It's usually one of the more laborious parts of sermon preparation for me. So this morning, it's my pleasure to offer the following introduction. I have no introduction. Here's the reason. The text we're looking at this morning is one of such importance. It is so full of content that really we just need to jump straight in. And so we'll read the text and then we'll begin. We're going to start in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. There's a lot there. I mean, just look at the sorts of topics that are covered in this text. Joy, deliverance, hope, courage, faith, life and death. Going to be with Christ, prayer, Christ's spirit, Christian progress, fruitful labor, glorying in Christ. Any one of these topics could present 40 minutes of material without a lot of effort. There's a lot packed into this text. And with a passage like this, a passage that's so full, I think it's particularly important, therefore, that we stay tethered to the text. And this is just a general point about preaching. If you notice that a preacher sort of uses the text at the front end as like a diving board, and then he just jumps into the pool of his own observations and swims around for 40 minutes, that's not desirable. That's not a good thing, particularly with a text like this. 
You may get an entertaining talk or an informative lecture from something like that, but you might not get a biblical sermon. And so it's my hope this morning that as with our prayer and the singing, that our preaching too would revolve around the text of God's word. When we gather, you don't need to hear my thoughts. You don't need to hear Alex's thoughts or observations. You don't need wit. You need God's word. I need God's word. God's word is the antidote to our sufferings. So why would I withhold that from you as a preacher of it? Let's hope that I don't. So this morning, we're just going to go through this text piece by piece. We'll organize the text into four headings. Paul's deliverance. Paul's declaration, Paul's dilemma, Paul's decision. Okay, so deliverance, declaration, dilemma, decision. Let's start with Paul's deliverance. So let's look back at our text. So we're starting at the end of verse 18 there. Yes, and I will rejoice. Okay, so just in that very phrase, we see he's hearkening back to what we've already seen in Philippians. Right, it's sort of a reference back, yes, and I will rejoice. So he's sort of doubling down on the rejoicing that he talked about earlier in verse 18. So, to refresh your memory, in verses 12 through 18 there, we're looking at Paul's imprisonment. So Paul's in prison as he's, as he's writing this letter to the Philippians. And as he's in prison, people are reacting to this imprisonment differently. Paul affirms, yes, more people are preaching Christ because I am in prison. However, some only do so out of envy and rivalry that they feel towards me and my ministry, Paul says. So he concludes in verse 18 that that doesn't matter. Nevertheless, yeah, sure, people are doing this out of envy and rivalry. Some people are thinking to afflict me by enhancing their ministries as mine is bound up here in prison. Nevertheless, I rejoice, Paul says. And remember, the Philippians are a dear congregation to Paul. Remember, we talked about that in the first two sermons. These people love Paul dearly, and Paul dearly loves them. And so they, being very concerned for Paul's welfare, are going to be paying close attention when he starts talking about how he's doing. In that previous passage, he starts off in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, they're listening. Okay, what's happened to Paul? Okay, we want, we want to hear how Paul is doing. We haven't heard for some time. They sent him very costly support Financially, even when no one else was. They sent Epaphroditus, one of their own, to, to take their letter to Paul. And he brought, them, he, brought, he brought Paul financial gifts and a letter. And Paul is just exuding gratitude to the Philippians for their support of him. And Paul points them, when he brings up his imprisonment, not to him and his circumstances and how he's doing, but he immediately deflects that attention to Christ. So it's precisely because of Paul's imprisonment that the gospel is going forward in a more focused way. And so in our text, starting with the last clause of that verse, verse 18, we see Paul doubling down on that conclusion. Yes, people are preaching the gospel out of envy and rivalry. There's a lot of conceit uh, that's happening in different people's ministries because I'm tied up here in prison. But I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. That's how our text starts. He continues, why is he rejoicing? For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So let's look at this. What does Paul mean when he's talking about deliverance here? Few possibilities. Either Paul is convinced that he is physically actually going to be delivered from prison. This will turn out for my deliverance, my deliverance from prison. I'm going to be released. He'll continue living his life outside of prison. It's a possibility. Or, Paul's using deliverance a little bit more abstractly. He's saying that he might die here as a result of his imprisonment. And yeah, that's deliverance. He's no longer in prison. You better believe that Paul means that, if that's what he means. Or, he's being intentionally sort of ambiguous here. Maybe physical deliverance. Maybe delivered by means of death. And as a preacher, it would be really, really easy for me to take that middle road and say, yeah, I think it means kind of both. Uh, but I think Paul means the first one. I think he's convinced that he's going to be physically released from prison. Now, I think that the, the last option is kind of sprinkled in there as well. I think he is being a little, bit ab a little bit ambiguous here, hinting at the fact that his deliverance might be through the door of death from prison. What do I mean? 
Well, Paul says that he knows that through their prayers and the help of Christ's Spirit, he will be delivered. Here's the reason why I take him literally and seriously here. Because of verse 25. Let's look down in the text a little bit, down to verse 25. What does he say? He's convinced that to remain in the flesh, to remain alive, is more necessary for the the help that he's going to bring to them. And in verse 25, convinced of this, I know, just like he said in verse verse 19, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you might have ample cause to glory in Jesus Christ because of my coming to you again. So I think that Paul knows, is convinced, that he will remain in the flesh, he will not die in prison, he will be released, and he'll come to see them again and encourage them through his ministry to them. However, we can't ignore the fact that in verse 19, as soon as he said that, he immediately turns to issues of life and death. So in verse 19, he says, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So I think there is a little bit of ambiguity going on here. Paul is saying, my deliverance from prison might be physical and I will come to see you again. I'm convinced of that. However, I'm going to honor Christ in my body whether I live or whether I die. Whether my deliverance is physical and actual, or whether it's spiritual and actual. So I think there is a little bit of ambiguity going on there. So Paul is truly convinced that he'll be delivered. He'll go to visit the Philippians. And if he's not delivered... He's truly convinced that he will be delivered and go to be with Christ. So there's there's two options. I'm going to be delivered and I'm going to come to see you and encourage you, or I'm going to be delivered and I'm going to go to be with Christ. You hear that thinking? I will be delivered from these bonds, Paul says. And if not, I will be delivered from these bonds. That's faith talking. If this sort of talking sounds strange to us, let me just admonish us by saying that's how faith sounds. We've seen this before in the scriptures. In Daniel 3, you may be familiar with the story. The Hebrew children that are in Babylonian captivity find themselves being forced to bow down to this statue of Nebuchadnezzar. They refuse to do it. Nebuchadnezzar brings them up before him and he threatens them with what? I'm going to throw you into this furnace of fire unless you bow down and worship the statue. And what do they say? O Nebuchadnezzar, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You hear that? My God is able to deliver me. More than that, my God absolutely will deliver me. And if he doesn't, still not bowing down. That's faith. That's how faith thinks. This is whole-souled conviction that God will act. And then subordinating my expectations to his wisdom. You follow that? I'm convinced God is going to act. Absolutely he will act. And I'm subordinating my, expectation, subordinating my expectations to whatever he says is right. We sing this here, don't we? Whatever my God ordains is right. There's a lot packed into that first word. Whatever. Think about that next time you sing that song. Whatever my God ordains is right. Anything my God ordains is right. If he chooses to do it, I say, good. It's right. And one brief word here, anyone who's skeptical of Christianity, like you have intellectual reservations against Christian thought, you could easily look at this sort of talking and say, okay, how does this make sense? Uh, So you really truly believe that God is going to act, but then you sort of hedge your bets in case he doesn't. And you call that faith. Well done, Christians. Isn't this just double speak? Kind of talking out of both sides of our mouth? No. Here's why. If you are a Christian 
you are guaranteed, guaranteed by God, promised that the only thing God will ever give you is what is for your best good. The only thing you will ever receive from God is what is for your best good. If he did not spare his own son, but freely offered him up, how will he not with him graciously give us all things? God did not withhold Christ from you, Christian. What's he going to keep from you? I'll tell you what he's going to keep from you. Anything that is not for your best good, that's what he'll withhold from you. Anything that is truly evil towards his children, he will withhold. Now, you may experience evil, but again, it's only measured out. It's on a leash because God knows it's only going to work for your best good. So the only thing you will ever receive from God is what is for your best good. So how can Paul be convinced that God will deliver him? Well, because God has promised to only do good for his people. But we live in a fallen world, right? Which we only experience through feeble senses. And we only process with often flawed reasoning. And our reasoning is bent towards self-preservation over anything else oftentimes. And so, who knows how much information we lack looking at any given situation. We would do things differently. Our best good, we think, would be this. So many hindrances between us and full knowledge of any given situation. And so what do we do? We acknowledge that even the very wise cannot see all ends. And so we go to the one who can. We go to Christ. We submit our hopes and our prayers to a God who does know all things, does see every end, and only ever does what's best for his people. So we believe he will do what we ask him, or he'll do something better. Only options, if you're a Christian. So this is how Paul views his deliverance. Next, we see Paul's declaration. Let's continue through the text. Now, the grammar really matters here. Because this is obviously, when you get to, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, you've obviously reached the, the high climactic point of this text. Everything leading up to that statement is doing just that. It's, it's leading up to it. And everything after that statement is just flowing out from it. Right? So there's build up and there's fallout and it's all hinging on this one big statement. To me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But let's read that whole section in its context. So this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation, it is my hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What does that mean? To live is Christ. Uh, it's an iconic biblical Pauline statement. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It's very common vernacular and sort of uh, Christian vocabulary. But it's sort of a strange construction, right? It's, it's a weird way of saying what he's saying. He doesn't say, you know, to live is to be faithful to Christ, or you know, to live is to live for Christ. He says, to live is Christ. So to live equals Christ. Strange way of constructing that. Now, it seems to partly be for like meter and sound sort of reasons. So in, in the Greek, the words Christ and gain sort of sound similar. And so you've got this little punchy, almost it's not like a rhyme, but it's like an assonance. Like there's sort of similar sounds in each word. So that comes through in the Greek and doesn't really come through in the English. So that's one possible reason. But I think what's beautiful about the way that this is said, one of the reasons it's been such an enduring passage in Christian thought is because of how short and terse and unqualified it is. There aren't a lot of qualifications here. There are none, really. Live equals Christ. That's what we've got. And because it's so unqualified, 
so general, so broad, it's comforting. It's motivating for God's people. For us, brothers and sisters, there's no area of life that does not fall under the umbrella of Christ's lordship, love, care, and protection of you. To live is Christ. Your union with Christ might be the defining aspect of who you are as a Christian. There's not one specific part of our life that's under the umbrella of Christ, and there's not one specific part of Christ that's offered to us as God's people. We get all of Christ, and it's spread out over every single aspect of our lives. There's no area of life over which Christ does not have dominion. No area of the Christian life that should, not be, that, that should be done without acknowledgement to Christ. Each endeavor should be done for his sake, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. It's another whatever. Be mindful that Christ is your master when you're at work. Work heartily because Christ is your boss. Are you resting? Rejoice that any rest we experience here is merely a foretaste of the glory of our eternal rest. Husbands, exemplify Christ's love towards your wife. Wives, honor your husbands as you honor Christ. Your meals, your commutes, your waking, your sleeping, your thoughts, your deeds, in each of these things, acknowledge Christ's grace to you. Recognize Christ's kindness to you as you sit down to eat a meal. You're going to sit down to lunch this afternoon. And there are millions of people around the world that would give an appendage to have the food in front of them that you're going to have in front of you. That should stir up love and gratitude towards Christ for his gifts to you. I've heard it put by one poet, God in every taste. What does that mean? Every time I take a bite, I'm just exuding gratitude towards God. Because even in our meals, he's being kind to us. So in what area of life should we not acknowledge Christ? Should we not be mindful of Christ? Reflecting on our union with him. Imploring his blessing over whatever our hand finds to do. And then striving to perform each and every duty such that Christ's merits are on full display in the way that we live our lives. That's how you get a coworker to come up to you and be like, what's up with you? What's different about you? What's going on there? You're putting on display the reality that you're united with Christ, that Christ is your Lord, Christ is your master. The great banner flying over the life of the Christian reads simply, Christ. It's not more complicated than that. So as all things are yours in Christ, so all things should be done for Christ. But not only to live as Christ, to die as gain. Now, this one to me is more obvious. Of course, death is gain for Paul. I mean, we've just examined how Christ is everything to Paul. So why wouldn't Paul see death for the gain that it is? It brings him to Christ, which is what he's already said, he wants more than anything. One commentator put it this way, precisely because Paul's life finds its total meaning in Christ, his dying, which entails being with Christ, must be viewed as advantageous. So again, what a backwards way we Christians should think. Death is advantageous? the thing that people have feared for millennia, we should see as gain, advantage, victory. It's the backwards way that a Christian thinks compared to how the world thinks. But let me address the obvious point here. Brother, sister, do you count death as gain? When you think of death, your own death, Do you see it as gain? Do you look at it as an advantage? A promotion? An upgrade? As opposed to something terrifying or frightful? My guess is that many of us don't. Death is a frightful and terrifying prospect. It can cause anxiety. 
dread, depression. It's not called our last enemy for nothing. It has some teeth. But I would like to speak to that for just a moment. Now, if you're here this morning and you're hoping that I have a a silver bullet to offer you, uh, to cure the fear of death forever, I have nothing for you. I often share your fears. But let me just implore you, implore us, to go to Christ. You fear death? You, You sit awake at night sometimes, thinking about your own heartbeat? You're afraid to die? Go to Christ. Christ has stores of rich comfort for his children who are afraid to die. Remember, he's already tasted death. He's been there, done that. Christ has died. Having experienced a magnitude of pain and suffering that none of us ever could. And yet, his spirit still inspires Paul to call death gain. He's been through it. He knows of what he speaks. Paul himself has suffered almost to the point of death, and yet he writes this. So Christian, do you forget what awaits you after death? All the glories, excellencies, joys, and thrills of this world with none of the sorrow, pain, fear, and sin. Imagine no sin. Imagine no fear. What must that be like? To be completely and rightfully unafraid. Because there are frightful things in this world. There are things that should stir up fear. But in that world, what? Only joy. Only thrill. Only delight. Only pleasure forever. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. So of course it's gain. Here we have anxieties and depression. There we have harmony and calm. And the only thing standing between this world and that one is death. It's the only barrier between us and eternal happiness. It's the doorway to life. How do we know that? Well, it was for Christ. Christ died, and then what did he do? He lived again. And so will you, Christian. So may we ask Christ to give us grace to die well. To be courageous in the face of death. To face death with open eyes and boldness. And not to shrink back. Hebrews 2 tells us, Since therefore the children, us, share in flesh and blood, Christ himself likewise partook of the same things. Why? Why did Christ take on flesh? That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. Then listen. And what else is he going to do? And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So if you find yourself enslaved by a fear of dying. Christ offers liberty from that. Christ wants to free those slaves. Say, no more fear of death for you. You get to view death as gain now. So now, how do you live your life when death is gain? What risk is too much now? If death is a friend that takes you to Christ. When Christ suffered for sinners, he took upon himself the death that we deserved. And now, any who come to him, turning from their sin and clinging to Christ by faith, he will not turn away, but will welcome into his presence forever so that they will never see death. Christian, you are going to die. But, Christian, you are going to live. Christ says to the Christian, you will not taste death, even when you die. Death takes you to life. That's all it can do. You're more than a conqueror through him who loved you. And death has been conquered. 
in Christ's campaign against death, the capital city has fallen. Nothing left now but the skirmishing. And Christ invites you to come and join his host in Pilgrim's Progress. Story of Christian pilgrims that are traveling from the city of destruction to the celestial city. As the company of travelers is coming near to the end of their journey, Bunyan says this. They began to be sorely weary, and they cried out unto him who loveth pilgrims to make their way more comfortable, so that when they had gone a little further, a wind arose and drove away all fog, so that the air became more clear. Sometimes there are dying graces that Christ has stored up for Christians. As we approach the end of our lives, Christ has grace for us there. He's promised to be with us to the end of the age. He's not going to abandon us at the point of death. Let me read an extended section of that book. So this is when the party is approaching the Jordan River. The cold, icy, bitter waters of the Jordan River that separate them from the celestial city, the promised land. And they've got got to go through it. Only one way to get to the celestial city. And it's through the Jordan River. So you can tell what the Jordan River symbolizes here for Bunyan. It's death. As Mr. Standfast is crossing the river, he turns and says this to his companion. This river has been a terror to many. Again, this is death. Yea, the thoughts of it have also frightened me. But now, methinks I stand easy. The waters indeed are to the palate bitter, and to the stomach cold. Yet, the thoughts of what I am going to, and of the conduct that waits for me on the other side, lies as a glowing coal warming my heart. I see myself now at the end of my journey. My toilsome days are ended. I'm going now to see that head that was crowned with thorns for me. I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I go where I shall live by sight and shall be with him in whose company I delight. I have loved to hear my Lord spoken of. His name has been sweeter than all perfumes to me. His countenance I have more desired than they that have most desired the light of the sun. His word I used to gather for my food. And, his anti- and for antidotes against all my faintings. He has held me, and my steps he has strengthened in his way. And after this, Mr. Stanfast's countenance changed, and he said, Take me, for I come unto thee. And he ceased to be seen of them. Uh, one of my very favorite poems is a poem called The Calvinist by John Piper. And it follows a Christian man through all the different facets of his life. Some of you may have read it or heard it. Waking, sleeping, eating, working with his wife, with his children. You see him sinning. You see him repenting. You see him worshiping. And the final stanza reads, See him nearing death. Listen to his breath. Through the ebbing pain, final whisper, gain. I love that. Because I want that to be me. Right? I want that to be you. I want that to be us. I don't want us to shrink from death or shrink from pain. I want us to be a people that faces death with courage. So, brothers, sisters, in life or in death, you're Christ's. It is Christ that awaits you on the other side of death. And all death can do is take you to him. And that same Christ offers help and strength for us to face death with boldness so that we, with Paul, can look at death and say, gain, profit, victory, my advantage. So to live, Christ. To die, also Christ. And therefore, gain. So it's Paul's great declaration there. The last portion of the text will will, will sum up under two headings that we'll address together. Paul's dilemma and Paul's final decision. So given these two options, uh, living, Christ, dying, gain, the second half of the text give us a look into Paul having a genuine dilemma, choosing which one he would rather have. 
And if that sounds foreign to you, like if dying and living being competing concepts sounds foreign to you, let's examine ourselves. Are we thinking rightly about death and life in Christ? Because for Paul, this is a genuine problem. He says, I'm hard pressed between the two. Can't make up my mind. So let's read that, that passage. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, <laughs> Paul says, if I'm to live in the flesh, you see what he's, see what he's doing there? Either I live in the flesh, or I live out of the flesh. I live, or I live. <laughs> That's great. It, it, Paul's adding there another way that we can think about life and death. Um, may, perhaps this is another defense against the fiery darts that are fired at us uh, of, of the fear of death. We look at a passage like this and say, okay, either I live in the flesh or I live some other way. But it's only living for the Christian. We cannot die even if we die. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I can't tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So these few verses capture this dilemma that Paul feels himself to be in when he says, I feel hard-pressed between the two options, living or dying. And after what we just discussed, hopefully we can see why going to be with Christ is appealing for Paul. But... Paul decides against going to be with Christ. You see that? He decides, yeah, my desire is to go and be with Christ, but honestly, it's more necessary for me to be here. I'm needed here. So Paul decides the best thing is to remain here with them instead of going to be with Christ. So if you've got scales and you've got go to be with Christ on one side, knowing Paul's love and affection for Jesus, what could you possibly put on the other side of those scales that would tip them in its favor? What could possibly compete in Paul's affections with his love for Christ? We've talked about it multiple times in the sermon series already. Paul's love for these saints. Paul's love for God's people. So he wants to be with Christ, he desires to go to be with Christ, but... Because he loves these saints, loves these people. They're so dear to him. They've loved him. They've supported him. He brought the gospel to them. He feels a fatherly affection for them. He feels a responsibility because of his love and his place in their lives to remain with them for their glory and their joy. So Paul loves these saints. And yes, he loves Christ and wants to be with Christ. But in loving the saints, he's loving Christ's own bride. When you love God's people, you're loving the bride of Christ. Christ is the head and we are the body. When you love Christ's people, for Christ's sake, you're loving Christ. And Paul realizes that his continuing to live is fruitful labor. It's necessary for them. Their progress, their joy in the faith is going to be stirred up. They're going to be brought to maturity by Paul's ministry to them. And so he says, yes, I desire to go and be with Christ, but you guys need me, so I'm, I'm ready to stay. And so Paul is in prison writing this. His fate could be deliverance, could be death, which we've seen is another kind of deliverance for Paul, could be suffering. And even though he would rather be with Christ, he's committed to continuing here on earth for the good of these saints. So I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the fellowship and edification of God's people provided Paul his very reason for living. I don't think that's an overstatement. The reason he's deciding that he wants to stay and live here on earth 
is because of their edification, their joy, and their progress. And it could, should, do the same for us. The edification, the encouragement, the building up, the admonishment of our brothers and sisters around us should provide us a reason for getting up in the morning. You might say, shouldn't Christ be our reason for getting up in the morning? We've already said to love Christ's people for his sake is loving Christ. Christ delights when you love his children. Christ delights when you love those that he died to save. It warms his heart. It answers his prayers. Christ has prayed for us that we would be one, even as he and his Father and the Spirit are one. So when you love your brother, when you love your sister for Christ's sake, you answer Christ's own prayers. You delight your Lord to love his people. Enjoy the glory of the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I urge you, brothers and sisters of Emmanuel Church, for Christ's sake, love one another with a pure heart, with tenderness and kindness and forgiveness. And if someone sins against you, someone's hard to deal with, guess what love does? Covers that up. Love covers a multitude of sins. The harmony and the joy and the glory of fellowship between us as brothers and sisters should provide us a reason for staying alive, a reason for getting up in the morning, and certainly a reason for coming to church each week. Right? You wake up on Sunday morning, don't feel like getting the kids ready, going to church. Write this sort of stuff around your house. Let it be in front of your eyes all the time. Paul stayed alive because he loved God's people. Let me get ready and go worship with God's people. It was good enough for Paul. It's good enough for you. It's good enough for me. So, brothers and sisters, Christ is our only hope in life and death. His church is a warm, welcoming house for weary pilgrims. And it is our prayer that God would make us lovers of Christ and lovers of his church so that, come what may, life or death, church is going to help you die well. It's part of what we do here with one another. When I'm dying, I want you guys to help me die well. I want you to encourage me. Hope I can be that for you. So life or death, come what may, brothers, sisters, let's be bold and courageous disciples of our Lord. Let's pray. God, we are fearful, fallen, fickle creatures. Our desires are led this way and that. We're often afraid and we doubt in spite of your many promises to us. But Lord, we want to be bold. We want to be courageous. So Lord, please, free us from the fear of death. Help us to let goods and kindred and this mortal life go. They may kill our bodies, but your truth still abides. Lord, please make us a people that can look at death squarely in the face and say, gain. Lord, utilize your church and the fellowship of the saints to bring this about in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond to...